going to kick off the afternoon session with uh, a talk by, from Steve Davies, who's the Director of Public Affairs for NatureWorks, uh, a bioplastics maker. And uh, he's responsible for the company's cradle-to-cradle -cradle strategy, including feedstock sourcing and, and strategy, and uh, product recovery strategies, and for managing the company's industry and stakeholder relations, external communications, and media relations. So I don't know what he does with their other days in the week. <laughs> but uh, when he's not wearing his NatureWorks hat, uh, Steve also has twice served as industry chair of the Bioplastics Council for the association formerly known as the Society of the Plastics Industry. And uh, he's also served as co-chair of the Washington-based biotechnology industry organization's uh, bio-based products working group. So uh, very active in the industry, uh, busy man in the biopolymer space. Please jo join me in welcoming Steve Davies from NatureWorks. Thank you, Bob. Note to self, don't give somebody a long bio because they might just read the whole darn thing. Um, Welcome back, folks, after lunch. And let me start with a big thank you to Doug for the invitation to engage again on uh, plasticity. We crossed paths first probably five years ago, Doug, and still enjoy the forum you're putting together. Um, I want to do three things with you in the next 30 minutes or so. First, give you a very, very quick intro to NatureWorks. I can say that because it's a video, so it's going to be a minute and 20 seconds, and that's it. Then I want to level set a little bit on plastics and drill a little bit more into some of the figures you've seen from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And then I want to spend the bulk of my time talking about um, applications and, and how the plastics industry as a whole, including the bioplastics piece of it, is really rethinking itself from a circular economy perspective. So I want to take what can often be a very vague abstract concept, circular economy, and really get granular in plastics and talk about what's happening. So let's just start with a quickie intro of who we, who we are and what we do. So Larry, if you could roll with the video, it'd be great. With some volume, Larry, may we restart it. Larry? Nope. Thank you. Back in 1989, we had a big, crazy idea. What if we could turn greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide into products? Nature does it all the time, turning carbon dioxide into plants, entire forests, and huge structures like coral reefs. So we got to work, looking to plants for inspiration. Plants capture and sequester carbon dioxide, transforming it into long-chain sugar molecules. We ferment those sugars to make lactic acid, the building block of a whole range of advanced materials we call INGEO. It took a lot of hard work and some real innovation to bring these new materials to market. But today, NGO is made into products like coffee capsules, diapers, cups, yogurt packaging, and electronics. And we're still innovating. Right now, we're working with bacteria to see if they can transform methane or carbon dioxide into NGO. Because we believe at the intersection of science, technology, and sustainability, we can change the world without changing it at all. NGO, naturally advanced. So that's all I really want to say about what we do, and I want to flesh this out a little bit. One of the things we've done as NatureWorks in the last two and a half years is formed a pretty close working relationship with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And you've heard this mentioned already a couple of times today and seen some of their data. The MacArthur Foundation, I think, is some, somewhat unique because they're not really an NGO. They're a think tank, a UK-based think tank that are really one of the leading architects of circular economy. And what they've done a wonderful job of is taking this abstract idea and making it very specific with what literally is a blueprint for plastics, starting with plastics in packaging. And what we like about what they've done is they've done this through a partnership with McKinsey from a business perspective. So they're making the business case for innovation instead of the typical sort of NGO position of what should be done. They're talking about what the money that can be made if it is done. So they've also done a very nice job of engaging a huge group of industry stakeholders from global brands, the Unilavers, the Coca-Colas, the Danones of the world, to the upstream industry, folks like ourselves. So we formed a corporate partnership with them two years ago to really engage in a big way on some of the working groups uh, they've put together. And what they rolled out, it, 
the World Economic Forum in 2016. And I think that's telling. They didn't do this at the COP climate change conference, an environmental venue. They did it at an economic forum. Again, the business case for change. What they rolled out was this blueprint in 2016. In January of this year, they rolled out a sort of second edition called Catalyzing Change, where they're really now starting to work with industry on working groups to affect change. So you've seen some of this, and I'll go through this quickly. You've seen some of these figures from other players. Let me just start by level setting here. Um, the figures are pretty amazing when you look at it. A 20-fold increase from 15 million tons to 300 over this time period. And what's probably more impressive is what's happening next, doubling in the next 20 years, quadrupling by 2050. So again, you've heard this language already, the sort of take, make, waste, linear model. Here they put the numbers around it. For that 25% of 25% of that uh, char, 26% actually of this volume is packaging, the single biggest application. For that 26%, which is some 78 million tons a year, it's almost completely sourced from virgin feedstock. And that virgin feedstock is essentially, we can say globally, 100% fossil based today. And what's nice about what they've done here is that it's possible to go down a lot of rabbit holes if you go locally and try and figure out recycling rates and get a handle on what's going on. It varies so much, even state by state here in the US. What this is then a, a global look that may be not exactly right, but it's the first global look we've seen. And the point here is essentially all virgin feedstocks, completely fossil-based today. Um, and then we talk about where it goes in this take-make-waste model. And so if we Pareto on the right-hand side where it's going, 40% globally ending up in landfill. 32% what they charitably call leakage, meaning to our national environment, our oceans, our landscapes. And then stepping down the Pareto here, 14% going to various energy recovery schemes and some 14% collected. And collected is the key word, not necessarily recycled. There's also some fractions that are, um, well, of that 14% of that that's collected, there's a lot of yield loss, 4%, and then top left, they differentiate what goes into so-called cascade recycling versus what they call closed-loop recycling, meaning in-kind, bottle to bottle. Cascade recycling means the plastics are recycled to something that won't be recycled the next time around in the current scheme. So the ambition of their blueprint is pretty obvious. Take that straight line, make it circular, right? Uh, make it circular with uh, much more reuse, much more recycling. And moreover, bottom left, to the extent that we have to use virgin feedstocks at all, they ought to be renewably sourced, not fossil based. And so over on the bottom right, you see, of course, the big ambition that is key for many coming to plasticity is about reducing leakage into our natural environments. So we like that construct. We're also, as a company, working very closely with the Sustainable Packaging Coalition in the US, which we were a founder of some 10 years ago. Many global brands belong to the SPC, and I like their construct because it really puts meat on the bone of the Ellen MacArthur's construct. This is packaging specific, but you could pretty well apply these criteria to any plastic. So, the, so the, the, and I've recut the Sustainable Packaging Coalition's metrics into four buckets, how the plastics are sourced, how they're manufactured, how they're used, and after use, and this is, this is their slide. And what we're seeing now is that the plastics industry as a whole, globally, is beginning to rethink itself from the circular economy perspective, and specifically along those four axes from the prior chart. So I think most here are probably familiar with this sort of radar plot when you measure how well you do by how well you fill, in this case, the diamond. It lets you look at more than two variables at once. So the plastics industry as a whole is beginning to look at you know, how well it's doing, grading itself on sourcing, what its plastics are made from of the three o'clock position, manufacture, how it's made and the externalities of that manufacture, how it's used, the functionality in use, and then finally, after use, where it goes, how it's recovered. And qualitatively, this is, you know, I get a lot of smirks when I show this, but the ideal material would really completely fill the diamond. And folks will say, yeah, but there is, nothing's actually gonna approach that. But I think it's useful to have sort of the picture. The ideal material would be, 100% completely renewably sourced. On the right would, be, would have zero impact manufacturing, no externality. On the left would be completely recovered. And of course, going down to the six o'clock position would work perfectly. And by the way, cost nothing. That would be ideal, right? So against that ideal, I think it's useful because if we grade the current plastics industry against that, 
it doesn't fill much of the diamond, and that's the point, right? There is essentially, per the Ellen MacArthur stats, there is no renewable sourcing to speak of on a global scale. It's fossil-based, so zero to the 12 o'clock position. There's quite an externality to the right from how it's made, and I'll talk more about that. And to the left, there's almost no recycling occurring on a global scale. Again, Ellen MacArthur stats, 2% globally. So it doesn't extend to the left or right at all. Where it does extend is down. Plastics work darn well, right? So one-dimensional play. That explains that huge growth curve you saw quadrupling uh, over the next, um, well, up to 2050. So the question the plastics industry is asking itself, and I see this happening because as a bioplastics producer, we're a member of the Plastics Industry Association in Washington, and we see this happening. It's sort of funny to watch. The plastics industry is saying, where do bioplastics fit? You know, how much can we stretch in the other three dimensions to get renewably sourced, to reduce the manufacturing externality, and to get better recovery? And so I want to talk about progress on, along each of these four dimensions now. And let's start by talking about sourcing and manufacture. So a quote from the Al MacArthur Foundation's 2016 report about the externalities from manufacturing plastics. Sounds kind of vague, and typically in this room up until now today, when we've talked about externalities from plastic, we've been resolutely end-of-life focused on big marine waste discussion. It's a serious issue, but I want to bring in another aspect, and this is the aspect of the negative externality that, that results just from making the plastic, regardless of what you do with it. So this is sort of the untold story, you will, behind the plastics we take for granted, that every kilo, say, of a polystyrene you make puts something around two kilos of CO2 into the atmosphere. That's just the, the, the carbon balance around the numbers. Similar for PET, for the polyolefins, the soft flexible materials, quite a bit lower. And the, the point from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is to roll that up to the big picture. If that strong growth, that 4x increase in plastics continues with, with this externality unaddressed, then today plastics account for, in their estimate, 2% of the global carbon budget, that budget that's um, attributing to the uh, two degree global warming cap we're aiming for at max. If we don't do anything but business as usual, with that plastics growth, their estimate is it will account for 15% of the global carbon budget, meaning carbon in the atmosphere. That's a pretty big externality that I think we as a plasticity forum ought to be including our thinking, not just the end of life. So the point here, obviously, and I'll talk about the plastic I know best, our own, is that because we took, per the video, carbon out of the atmosphere, sequestered it by growing plants, taking those plant sugars and turning them into something, we've obviously going to have a lower carbon footprint. It's kind of a given. By no means greenhouse gas neutral. We use power to run our factories. But we can significantly reduce that environmental burden just from making the plastic. And these carbon credentials matter. In the run-up to COP15 in Paris, you saw many global brands lining up right before or right after COP15, the climate change conference, making some pretty lofty commitments about carbon footprint reduction. Walmart was one of the first, probably eight years ago now, committing to take 20,000 tons of carbon out of their supply chain and acting against it, putting you know, actions behind words. So it matters. An example here, and I've rolled in some examples from the industry because I'm often in the position of speaking for the bioplastics industry. This one is pretty well known, the plant bottle. A speaker mentioned it this morning at Heinz use of the uh, bio-based PET. Here, Coca-Cola leading the charge, doing the right thing, trying to move bio-based content move toward the 12 o'clock position. It's a laudable goal, and they're doing a nice job of really moving the needle because they're so big, making the same material, performing, nicely performing PET, you see it in the clear bottles on the table, but doing it bio-based. The point the Al MacArthur Foundation makes is that's all great, it's well and good, but we need more than evolutionary change, tweaking the way we make things, we need revolutionary change, and we like the language they use here. They talk about needing moonshots, and I presented this in Korea and realized uh, a couple of months ago no one had a clue what a moonshot was. A uh, U.S. audience will know that, but it's what Kennedy's challenge that got us into space by the end of the 60s. And for somebody making bio-based plastics, we sort of love the fact that we're credited with being mature. We don't feel very mature yet over on the right, but they're saying that's kind of a given, bio-based. Why don't we look at direct conversion of greenhouse gases? And just let me give you some examples of where folks are actually looking at that now. So moonshots in the bioplastic space, this is direct conversion of a greenhouse gas. 
CO2 is the greenhouse gas we think of most. Methane is another one. It's uh, roughly 23 times more potent than CO2 in its effect on global warming. Three companies here listed that are actually looking at, in some cases already doing it, direct conversion of methane as the feedstock to their plastic. Two of these, New Light and Mango, are little startups on the West Coast making something called a PHA, which is a soft, flexible uh, plastic, very degradable, um, competes probably closest to polyethylene in its properties. The right-hand one obviously know best, my company, we're looking at making our plastic from it. Ours is a hard, rigid material, much closer to polystyrene and PET in its properties. This can be really abstract, um, but specifically, very simply with a cartoon here, what we're talking about is taking, in our case, methane, CH4, using naturally occurring bacteria that do exist, these methanotropes, and using them to make, in our case, what we want, the monomer we need to make our polymer. These methanotropes exist in nature. They were responsible in the Gulf of Mexico for cleaning up the Gulf when that Gulf oil spill occurred in 2010. Methane concentration, along with all the oil in the Gulf, there was a lot of methane being bubbled out. The, the bacteria concentration in the seawater bloomed, digested the methane, and then died off. That's nature handling itself. What we're doing is designing those bacteria to make what we want. Those other companies have done it to make the other polymer I taught you about, PHA. There's a whole slew of folks also looking at doing this directly with CO2. Say a CO2 rich stream from an industry smokestack, for example, a power plant that generates power and puts out a lot of CO2. So that's happening. It's a long shot. Moonshot is good, it's a good word for it. It may not work, but we're investing in it. We've gotten a um, couple of million dollars from the uh, Department of Energy in the US to fund this. It's a five to, year, five to seven year project. My point here, just to wrap this up, is it's not just a couple of companies, mine included, looking at it. This is an industry looking at it now. And I just give you this as an example. This is an invite that popped up every week in my, um, in my inbox last fall for what is now the fifth annual conference looking at CO2 as a feedstock. So this is sort of where bio-based plastics were back in the 80s and 90s. You know, it's beginning, this, this look. So, I've talked about manufacture. Let me shift to use. And for us, um, one of the challenges I think the bioplastics industry has had is it's long sort of defined itself by how it was different. Different because it could be bio-based, different because it could be biodegradable. And this state in the obvious that these plastics are being sold because they have a function and they work well. So more and more, uh, I've been quoted recently as saying, I wish bioplastics weren't called bioplastics. I introduce myself these days as a plastics producer. We make functional materials, happen to be bio-based, happen to be compostable as, if it's relevant. In many of our markets, it's not. So here's an example where this, this is a 3D printing example where the substrate of choice in 3D printing around the world is the polymer we make. Why? Absolutely not because it's renewably sourced. Not at all because it's compostable, of course not. It's because it has the right physical characteristics. It doesn't shrink much when you cool it, so it makes a high-resolution printed part, accurate prints. So it competes with styrene, ABS polymers. And one of the things it gives you is a less expensive polymer. And for those printing at home with their $300 home printer, they don't have to spell styrene. So it's a functional play here. Some other ones, and here we, now we've introduced new grades that will replace ABS to make engineering parts, not just prototypes, but operating parts. Here's a, a, an example I really love. I heard the founder of this startup uh, at our conference last year is 3D printing uh, prosthetic hands for kids to use in developing countries that can't afford expensive things. And literally, it's an open source model where they'll size the hand as the kid grows, they'll print another hand next year. Um, and it's, it's fantastic to see our material actually being used functionally and not just because it perhaps is compostable. So one last point on manufacture um, I didn't mention earlier, but the foundation talks about the need for bio-benign materials. Same language was used by Greenpeace, and this is an old pyramid of plastics from Greenpeace many years ago, but you can see from their point of view, and it's a funny pyramid because it's inverted. Normally, the best is top of the pyramid. What they like least is PVC. And as you think you mentioned this, Paul, PVC, you, it is clearly being phased out, except where it's absolutely needed for functionality. But they're sort of voting for bio-based benign molecules. And lactic acid, I didn't say this earlier, but what we use is made in the body. 
occurs naturally when you work out and you get a muscle burn, that's lactic acid. What we've done is industrialize the production of that to make a functional material. So that leads us to markets that we weren't originally targeting, but people grabbing this plastic to make baby toys. I'll wrap up here with um, an example, last example I'll show in this space, um, which I think is, I, we see as a huge opportunity. Many of the brands around the world see this as a, a real challenge, and this is just a, a screenshot I grabbed from a website. You can find out there, it's called Kill the K-Cup. And it shows the pressure that anyone using disposable coffee capsules is facing um, because of the love-hate relationship we have as consumers with the K-Cup, the format makes good, convenient coffee, very hard package to deal with on the waste end. So we look at that, and that challenge is that websites like that and movements like that happen because of this growth curve. 35 billion plastic capsules, you can look at the growth on the right from an industry, uh, independent industry consulting company, um, both in volume of capsules and money. But for us, that challenge is for the plastics industry, I think, an opportunity and just the opportunity is about, in this case, diverting those organics from landfill. If you just put on the table the amount of coffee that is no longer, that is blocked from going where it ought to go, compost, coffee should go to industrial compost or home compost. It can't because it's literally entombed in plastic packaging or aluminum packaging. It's a lot of coffee. We've had interesting discussions with the composters lately who are basically saying, we want our nitrogen back. Coffee is a huge source of nitrogen, which you need for a compost product. And they've seen the difference as they get less and less coffee grounds. So this is, I think, an interesting case where we as an industry and some of our industry, co industry colleagues really sit amidst um, a nexus of supply chains. We sell, to be clear, plastic pellets by the rail car, but we sell them into supply chains that make flexible films for lidding on the capsule, sell them to companies that make non-woven filters, we sell them to companies that make injection molded or thermoformed cups. So our customers are the supply chains that all converge on this humble coffee capsule that essentially now has really no end of life. It's too small to be recycled, although there's many recycling trials some of the brands are doing. Typically, this would just fall out of the first screen under two-inch screen at a recycler. We believe that this is a case where the functionality of the plastic, its composting function, the barrier it can give you and its heat stability all converge to really give you a value play that makes sense. And it's not academic. There are already many small suppliers making coffee capsules from our materials, and here is some examples of them, whether it's the filter, the lidding, um, the capsule body itself. There are many companies already out there doing it. Many folks are making compatible systems, for example, for Keurig. Keurig is still sort of looking at what it wants to do in this space. Does it want to go recycling route? What's the real play with composting? And I don't want to overplay compostability. Uh, just as there's a missing recycling infrastructure in much of the world, the same is true for composting. Parts of the U.S. are very good at it. Other parts don't really have that access at all. So this is um, a play that will make sense in the right local market. So lastly, I've talked about three of these four dimensions. Um, I have no idea, Doug or Bob, how I'm doing on time, so tell me if I'm up on five, four minutes? <laughs> okay, good. Lastly, let me talk about this after-use dimension, which is truly where most of the discussion around bioplastics focuses. Um, and we're happy to talk about it, but we also don't want to miss the functionality piece that we really think is driving the market. After-use, what we like to look at is how do we put a, a firewall, a hard line around landfill, stop our materials going in there, because truly today that's where most of them end up, in developed countries that do landfill. Um, and how can we check the box, or can we check the box on these five options up above it? Which of them can we check the box on? And the point for us is that mechanical recycle and energy recovery are typically the routes available to those conventional plastics in volume today for which infrastructure exists. Typically number one, number two, polymers, PET, HDPE in most developed countries. The other the intermediate ones of feedstock chemical recovery, typically not an option for complicated polymers. Um, and the biological roots, compost or anaerob anaerobic digestion, not an option at all for, for non-compostable plastics. So a lot of my role, and what my small group works on, is moving this, yeah, check the box, this, this could be done to our plastic, to making it real. 
Because these aren't consumer claims. This just says what could be possible, not what's happening. I want to be clear. So let's talk about two examples, the composting example and the recycling example. And I'm going to give you US statistics here. The argument for compostable plastics is very simple. They're only of use if they are a vehicle to divert organics from landfill. There's no argument at all to, to compost a, a clean plastic. It ought to be recycled, is our argument. I, I call it the 28% opportunity in the US, because if you look at that pie chart of what's in landfill, and I see no lost some figures here, but the top blue and yellow pieces of the pie add up to 28% of what's in landfill is organic. Can degrade in landfill, make methane, cause global warming. That shouldn't go in landfill. It should go to compost. It typically goes to landfill today. And Larry, you're going to have to help me because this slide is not advancing again. Could you advance? Now, yeah, go back. Huh. I guess we're not going to get the rest of my slide. What there was supposed to show here was a pretty graphic picture of what comes out of the back end of a restaurant, mixed food waste and disposable plastics. Pretty, pretty much of a mess. The food prevents the plastics from being economically recycled. The plastics contaminate the food and condemn it to landfill instead of compost, making that whole mixed stream from a restaurant, a cafeteria, compostable, enables it to go to compost. And that is what's happening increasingly. To move that from being a theoretical construct to reality, we have partnered with an organization called the Green Sports Alliance two years ago. And we did it because of this statistic. And if there's any scientist in the room, they usually grimace at this. They hate the fact that so few folks follow science, but everybody follows sports. But as a marketer, you look at this and you say, hey, that's an opportunity. If I want to move the dial, sports can move the needle. And that's why we partnered with the Green Sports Alliance. The alliance in the US is basically all the major leagues, some 300 members, the teams and the venues they play in, from soccer to basketball, football, baseball. You can probably recognize your favorite logo up here. That's the organization. They're interested in reducing water usage, power usage, and also waste coming out of their member stadiums. And that's where our paths intersect, because we work with them in impl implementing zero waste models. So this is a, a, a sampling of the case studies we put together. These are case studies, but they're um, documentation of conversion that has occurred from um, Major League Baseball, twins in my hometown, uh, Minneapolis St. Paul to Portland Trailblazers, there's universities, all of them basically go into a model where they can control what's in their stadium, the forks, the cups, the cutlery, make it compostable, dictate a clean compostable stream that goes to a local composter. It's not only happening in closed venues, as an example here of Taco Time in the Northwest, um, which is a small regional chain, and you can see here um, their tonnage what happened when they went to compostable products and what they were able to divert from landfill. So this isn't theoretical, is my point. It's by no means every city in the US. We still see many folks marketing compostable cups when there's no infrastructure. But it does help folks really close the loop and divert materials from landfill where the infrastructure exists. So let me wrap up. Last point before Bob starts yelling at me on recycling. And here, going back to the MacArthur Foundation's construct, 86% of materials not recycled. As a company, introducing today very, very small niche, essentially, volumes of a new of the world plastic, we don't want to become part of that 86%, which frankly is where we are today, too small to be recycled. Most plastics, and bioplastics are no exception, can be recycled. PLA is no exception. It's long been routinely recycled at the post-industrial level. All of our customers, of course, recycle their own scrap. That's a given. It isn't like many plastics today, uh, which are not yet recycled at the post-consumer level. It's not happening yet. In our case, because it's too small, for most plastics, it doesn't happen because the economics are so poor with low, low virgin prices. But what we're interested in doing is developing models for recycled new to the world materials as we scale up volume in the market. And it won't just be us. We have a, a major industry colleague now building its own PLA, because that is the generic name for the polymer we make. We have an um, industry colleague building its own world scale PLA factory in Thailand. So there will be more. What we're interested in doing is putting together models for the recycle of new to the world materials, where 
we can collect those small materials and grow a recycling model as the volume grows. And to that end, we're sourcing truckloads of post-consumer PLA now from Taiwan. I mentioned it to some of you. Taiwan is very advanced in terms of their collection infrastructure. We basically set our own PLA bale specification, and I would say we're probably the only virgin polymer producer on the planet today that's beginning to actually buy back its own materials. We're not naive. We're not going to make money doing this, but we want to show that this material can be recycled. We want to be our own market and ideally, perhaps, introduce... We have 21 NGO grades today. What I used to make textiles is different than what I used to make a cup. We'd like to introduce a grade that has post-consumer content, and that's the product development we're working on. Because this polymer is very much like PET in terms of how it recycles, fits into the same systems. So I've gone through, I think, more than my time allotment here and given you sort of a broad smattering, but I wanted to touch on not only what people normally talk about with bioplastics, which is where it comes from and where it goes, but also how it's made and how it works. And show the business case for us is starts with functionality in use. The tiebreaker, if, if folks like how it functions at the right price, the tiebreaker is it's bio-based. And in some cases, they like the fact that it's compostable. So I'll pause there for questions. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, Doug, but... Could have the... Yeah. Anyone have a question for Steve? All things bio? How about some of the students up in front? Here, here's yeah. one. Um, if no one's going to ask, then uh, I'll go. Um, so uh, how about the toxicity and the additives that are added to the plastic? Uh, are they very different from the other plastics, or how does that work? How different are they, or what, how similar are they? What was the first half of the question? Um, toxicity of the plastic and also additives. Um. We, we get asked that question a lot. And look, I'll be the first to say I came out of the conventional plastics industry, and I had have a high impatience for the question around toxicity of plastics, PE, HDPE, Polypropylene PET are pretty darn clean, not much in them. And Rick, you'll probably maybe speak more to this. They're good materials. What we don't like about them is they're fossil-based and not largely recycled. What we're after is replacing them with something that functions better and sells because it functions. And that's why I like that coffee capsule example or 3D printing example. To your question for us specifically, we're starting with a non-toxic monomer, which many people like, lactic acid. We're making it into a homopolymer, polylactide, we call it in geo. Um, folks will add colorants, other things like they do with other plastics, but it's not really a toxicity issue and we're not. The value proposition for us is really not about reducing a toxicity concern, it's about bringing new functionality. Does that make sense? Question over yeah. here. Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, conversion of methane into a uh, bioplastic feedstock and whether y'all had considered partnering with landfills as far as, because I, I just know in this area we have a lot of landfills that have adopted gas capture systems, but yeah. they're still looking for, um, they're producing more than they can actually use at this sure. point. It, it's a kind of a leading question actually. We, we are actually doing that, not landfill today, but wastewater treatment, which generates land, uh, methane and has been doing it by design for much longer than landfills, which are sort of often unintentional anaerobic digesters. Wastewater treatment, sewage digestion has long been by design a methane generator. We actually received, I think I mentioned it, two and a half million dollars from the DOE to include um, local, locally supplied biogas from a local wastewater treatment facility in the Minneapolis area. Um, that we're, we're, at this point, I should emphasize, this is very small. We're literally going there once a month and getting a bottle of biogas, bringing it back to our labs and using it for our lab fermentation. But absolutely, we, it's what we're interested in. Matt? Thanks, Steve. It was a great presentation. I love the diamond diagram. That was <laughs> incredibly helpful and also uh, how you overlaid where we currently are <laughs> in relation to that diagram. So. Um, my question was, you know, one of the things that really struck me is, again, just how little of the market for, for plastics today is bio-based. And I know Ellen MacArthur has, there's been a tremendous splash on, on that, but what, what's it actually going to take for us to get to much more bio-based sourcing? I think it comes down to economics, and I pulled the chart out of here in the interest of time, but there's an untold story as well in economics. If you look at producing... Today, we can make PE, PET, or PLA, in our case, NGO, from sugar. 
you get a look at the fundamental conversion efficiency from a pound of sugar, how many pounds of polymer does it make? And as much as Coke has done a wonderful job driving this market, the basic chemical stoichiometry from sugar to PET means you take about three pounds of sugar to get a pound of PET. PE, bio-PE, like a company like a Brazchem in, in that market, something similar. I think it's 3.2 pounds of sugar to make a pound of PE. So much, as much as we love what they're doing, you compare that with, with a plastic like our own, which takes one, point, one and a quarter pounds of sugar makes a pound of Ingeo. That's why our parent company, one of our parents, Cargill, bet the farm on this, literally, back in the late 90s because of that fundamental efficiency. Um, I gave you our example, but there are the polymers. There's a polymer now getting commercialized in Thailand called poly, well, let's just give you the acronym, PBS, a soft, flexible material, degradable. I think that has a yield of one pound of sugar makes a pound of polymer. We think long term, those are the plastics decades out that will win because of that fundamental, I mean, circular economy is all, not only about recovery, it's about fundamental conversion efficiencies and how well you convert raw materials into finished products. And that usually gets lost here. So um, long-winded answers your question, but I think to get more conversion, it's going to take, um, I think, people really looking at the funnel economics of, and um, how much they can afford to scale up. So we think the polymers that convert with the best efficiency will win long, long term. But it's a, it's a highly capital intensive uh, arena to build polymer factories. Wow, that was great. Anyone else? Last one? Okay, thank you very much, Steve. We appreciate thank it. You. And thanks for supporting plasticity again.